Well, hello everyone and thank you very much for coming. Now, I'm going to be asking questions of you, the audience, today because, as David Cameron once said, what harm could possibly come from asking people to vote on stuff which they haven't really thought about much before? <laughs> now, this is my tenth conference, right? I can count on one hand the amount of times I've seen this technology actually work. So, um, I wanted to have a bit of a trial run before we start, okay? So, everyone's got a smartphone? Yeah? And we're going to go onto our smartphones and we're going to log, log on to www.sly.do. People here don't have smartphones. You can just raise your hands, I guess. Um, and it's going to ask you for an event code, which the hashtag is already there, but you type in RCGPAC, uh, all capitals. That's what I'm going to try and do now. And then we should be able to see our first question. Uh, my colleagues at the back can set it up. Yeah, you can get to it on the app if you have had the sense to pre-download the app, which I haven't. Um, so you need to pick the Karen room, which is the red dot that we're in if you're doing it on the website. And then hopefully we can see some answers coming in. Wow, people are doing it. I'm amazed. Uh, okay. <laughs> Fantastic. So... It looks like we're kind of up to grips with it. Well, 30 people in the room have managed to do this, and everyone else is like, no, we're not getting involved. That's fine. 30, look at you. Uh, fantastic. And, um, yeah, so this was, there's, there's no wrong answers to this question, uh, <laughs> except for the second one. Uh, you clearly are using the Slido tool. So we're, <laughs> we're in the presence of some mavericks. I like that. Yeah, sticking it to the man. We're not going to answer your damn four questions. That's good. Okay. So um, I think we can now start. Now, I want to talk to you uh, today about the historical relationship between the people who prescribe drugs and the people who make them. I don't know if you can put my slides back on, guys. Fantastic. Um, so my name is Pete Deverson. I'm a GP, at the, a GP partner at the Derby Medical Centre in Epsom. Way of conflicts of interest, I also write for Pulse magazine. I've also done presentation work for other medical organisations and some biotech companies. So I kind of know what I'm talking about. But that's enough about me. I want to talk about this guy. Full ready had he his apothecaries to send him drogas and his lechueries. For etch of him, mad Uther for to win her. Her friendship nas not know to begin her. Now, I'm sorry to tell you, but you've all just been dissed in Middle English, right? <laughs> Solid burn, okay? Now, those were Geoffrey Chaucer's words describing the Doctor of Physic in his Canterbury Tales. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, these are a series of tales written at the end of the 14th century concerning a storytelling competition that takes place between a group of pilgrims as they travel to Canterbury. And one of these pilgrims is a doctor. And while Chaucer takes great pains to stress his wisdom and his skill in his profession... He's also critical of his love of gold and the dodgy relationship based on mutual profit that he shares with the local apothecaries who make the drugs he prescribed. Now, this is 631 years ago, right, in one of the greatest works of English literature, and yet we're still having the same problem today. So I want to ask you the next question, if that's okay. Uh, have you ever accepted a free gift from a pharmaceutical company? <laughs> yes or no? Um, now, think about it. This doesn't have to be a yacht. It could be a free textbook at medical school. It could be a slice of pizza in the doctor's mess. If you've ever signed a prescription with a logo-branded pen, yeah, that counts, okay? Okay, so the Mavericks are still in here, 8%. You're lying, guys. I know you have, okay. Um, but most of us, I think, are in the position where we have accepted free gifts from pharmaceutical companies because that's what we do. Okay. So, again, if I can move on to my slides. Thanks, guys. Um, in the Middle Ages, the apothecary was the person who made the medication that the physician prescribed. And they're like a part pharmacist, part grocer. They sold perfumes and spices and later tobacco. And they're more than a little like a GP, so giving advice and treatment for minor ailments. Now, the physician and the apothecary uh, would refer each other patients, but they'd also, to some degree, be in competition with, uh, for them. 
This is a Venetian apothecary painted about 1750. You can see he has some quite well-heeled patrons there queuing up for his uh, advice. Now, the doctor was of a higher social standing and could charge higher fees for treatment. This is a painting by Jan Steen, a Dutch artist, in 1665, and we see the doctor on a home visit. Now, I think this counts as a failure of triage because this patient is clearly well enough to get in a cab and come down to base, okay? <laughs> but the doctor's not too upset because no sooner has he taken his gloves off and the maid's offered him a nice glass of wine. So it's a win-win, right? Um, now, can anyone get, guess the diagnosis here? Does anyone know what's wrong with this patient? I heard lots of words, I don't know. The answer is she's pregnant, okay? The clever doctor has uh, dipped a ribbon in her urine there, and he's burnt it, and that smell induces nausea, which is the 17th century Dutch version of clear blue, okay? And then he's like, nailed it, booze time, okay? And uh, in, to remove any uncertainty, the artist has included this unsubtle, butt-sniffing canine foreplay in the background as a visual clue, okay? Now, we're going to skip forward two centuries to another home visit, okay? Sadly, by this time, a glass of wine has been downgraded to a cup of tea. Um, but at least the patient has the decency to actually look like they might need a visit. Okay? Now, it's hard to look at this painting and not feel professional sympathy for the doctor. It's 1890. right? There's not much he can actually do for this febrile child. There's no cowpole. There's no antibiotics. There's no Emis Webb to set off a sepsis alert. Uh, all you can do is like sit by the bed and look concerned. Now, that's all I can do. A uh, kindly doctor might reduce or waive his fees for a poor family like this, and indeed it's possible this is artistic license and a doctor wouldn't really visit a house like this at all at night because the expense of doctor's bills meant that ordinary people were looking elsewhere for their treatment. If you were sick in the Victorian era, you might go out and buy something like this, uh, patent medicine. Now, there was no requirement for manufacturers to test patent medicines for safety or to prove they had any therapeutic value. They were heavily marketed to the general public with outrageous claims about their curative properties, and they'd often be named after fictitious doctors or lay claim to have mystical, oriental, or Native American origins. Now, the medical establishment hated patent medicines, partly for financial reasons, uh, because they could be obtained without prescription, but more nobly because they recognized them as being, for the most part, quackery. Right? The two types of patent, patent medicines there's useless placebos, like this one, which contained alcohol and some harmless herbs, might have at most a, a mild laxative effect. And then there were the dangerous ones, like this one. So Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup was very good at keeping teething babies quiet, and that was down to its two ingredients, alcohol and morphine. <laughs> really? That was what it was? Okay. Now, there's this concerted campaign at the turn of the 19th century by the American Medical Association, journals like The Lancet, to get patent medicines regulated. And it was the success of this campaign that gave rise to the modern pharmaceutical industry. The doctor's organizations contrasted the dangerous or ineffective patent medicines with what they called the ethical drug companies. That's the small section of the drug market that made the pure chemicals mixed by pharmacists to make up doctors' prescriptions. Now, the popular press turned against patent medicines with uh, exposés like these in Collier's Weekly. And in 1906, the Food and Drug Administration was established in the USA to put limits on what could be sold. So many patent medicines disappeared or they underwent a rebrand. So Coca-Cola, which as the name suggests originally contained cocaine, uh, is no longer sold as a brain tonic. Then you've got Dr. Pepper, which I always thought was an incongruous name for a fizzy pop, until I realized its origin as a patent medicine. And you've got two local favorites on the end here. You've got Iron Brew and Buckfast, right? Now, I couldn't find a Bucky advert from the early 20th century, but you can see it was still being advertised in the 1960s as a kind of pick-me-up for depressed housewives, okay? <laughs> now, the demise of the gradual demise of the patent medicines favored both doctors and the ethical drug companies who supplied their treatments. So these companies began to market direct to physicians with catalogues like this one, the uh, Exerpta Therapeutica, which was made by Wellcome in 1916. And this is somewhere between like an Oxford handbook and a BNF. You've got lists of ailments and then corresponding list of medications, all available from Wellcome, which you could use to treat them. And these books would be supplied for free to physicians by traveling salesmen, known as detail men, so-called because they could provide the doctors with the details of the new drugs that were becoming available. And the services of the detail men were invaluable to the medical profession at the time. Now, these pictures are both by the American popular artist Norman Rockwell, uh, 
few decades apart. Now, firstly, it's great to see we're not doing home visits for children anymore. That's a positive step. But just think about the changes in medicine that took place between the first picture uh, in the 1920s and the one on the right in 1959. The doctor on the left could have been trained by that Victorian doctor we saw a few slides ago holding his bedside vigil, and he wouldn't have had much more in the way of available drugs. But there soon followed an explosion in new pharmacological treatments that were actually effective. So vaccines against <coughs> diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, and polio, and then medicines like penicillin, prednisolone, paracetamol, benzodiazepines, major tranquilizers, and all manner of other breakthroughs from insulin to elastoplast. Now, there was no system in place at the time for continuing medical education. You just got your medical degree, and if you were diligent, you read the journals, and that was how people kept up to date. And the appearance of the detail men would have been an absolute godsend to uh, the doctors in the paintings. In fact, if you were a doctor who refused to see detail men, you'd have been looked down on by your peers for not making an effort to keep abreast of all the latest advances. Now, remember, these are the ethical drug companies, yeah? rather than the patent medicine companies selling their snake oil. So we're thought of as being helpful to us. So it's time for my next question, if that's okay. Fingers on your buzzers, guys. Uh, thinking back to the gifts that you've all received from pharmaceutical companies, um, did you alter your prescribing habits as a result? So I think that's, that's everybody, is that? Okay. Right. If I can have my slides back again then, guys, that's fantastic. Uh, okay. We'll return to the detail men in just a moment. Because we're up to the 1950s, I wanted to talk briefly about this guy. Um, now, does anyone recognize this man? Does anyone know who this is? Nearly. Very good. Okay. So this is John Bodkin Adams, who worked as GP in Eastbourne uh, between 1922 and 1956. Now, Eastbourne was and is a town full of rich widows. And between 1946 and 1956, more than 160 of Dr. Adams' patients died after being visited at home and prescribed opioids or tranquilizers. And of those, 132 had left money to Dr. Adams in their wills. <laughs> Now, this sounds highly suspicious by the standards of today, but it was not unusual at the time for doctors to be remembered in this way by deceased patients. Nonetheless, there were enough complaints from relatives for the police to become involved, and when his house was raided, Dr. Adams was caught trying to conceal two bottles of morphine. He went on trial for murder at the Old Bailey in 1957, but he was sensationally acquitted after various prosecution failings. Um, he was found guilty of prescription fraud, uh, of obstructing an investigation and of lying on cremation forms and he was struck off the medical register although he was later reinstated and this is the case which gives us the, uh, the doctrine of double effect that is it's legal to prescribe a lethal dose of opiates or to give a lethal, lethal dose of opiates if your intention is to relieve pain and it's also the reason we now have registers for controlled drugs which must be countersigned so we're going to go back to the detail men right this is uh, Ernest Dichter, uh, Dichter the father of motivational research fascinating guy he was born in Austria in 1907 into a Jewish family, son of a salesman, and he went to work in sales, but then he retrained as a psychologist in Vienna in the 1930s, where he was taught by uh, uh, Adler and uh, Freud's daughter, Anna, amongst other people. Um, now, when the Nazis annexed Austria in 1938, Dichter, along with thousands of other Viennese Jews, uh, ended up as a penniless refugee in New York. And so what he did was he wrote to failing company saying, hi, I'm Ernest Dichter from Austria, and I'm going to turn your business around using my psychology skills. Well, how? Okay. So everyone's probably heard of the term focus group, right? Ernest Dichter invented the focus group, is his word, okay? And what he did, he did in-depth qualitative interviews with consumers about what motivated them to buy certain brands. This is one of his focus groups. He's asking these housewives about their subconscious erotic feelings towards soap. 
You did that. You did that. Okay. Um, now, Dijkstra's motivational research was wildly successful in the 1950s. He made a great deal of money for those companies he contacted, and his ideas did much to shape the fields of advertising and of marketing in the 20th century. He's credited with, amongst other things, the cunning placement of sweets at the supermarket checkout and the sexualized physique of the Barbie doll. Think about it. First child's toy with prominent breasts sold millions. Freudian. Now, WTF, does all this have to do with drug reps? You may be asking, okay? Um, well, in 1955, Dichter wrote an industry commission paper called A Research Study on Pharmaceutical Advertising, which involved extensive interviews with physicians about their interactions with detail men. Companies had previously assumed that what doctors wanted was lots of technical detail about the new products. But what the doctors told Dichter in the focus groups was they actually felt overwhelmed by all of this new information they were expected to take on board. And they really just wanted someone who they could trust to kind of tell them what to do. That having a real life person to build a rapport with the physician, to talk to them, to give them five minutes away from patient care, that was going to end up selling far more drugs than any number of technical information handouts. And so the drug companies really took this on board. They began to employ more detail men. They started placing less emphasis on scientific training and more on people skills, on uh, psychological sales techniques, and even on the physical attractiveness of the salespeople themselves. <laughs> they began to offer more free gifts, which became free meals, which became free holidays. And the modern drug rep was born, and sales went up and up as a result. And this is where the conflict of interest comes in, right? On the one hand, you've got a professional duty to provide the objective best treatment for your patient. First, do no harm, all of that, right? On the other hand, you feel obligated to prescribe whatever the reps are selling through this sort of pressure of social politeness and the psychological desire to reciprocate after receiving a gift, no matter how small. And lots of other micro-triggers that the drug companies know about because Dichter and his successors in the marketing industry have told them all about it. The journalist Carl Elliott described the relationship between doctors and pharma reps thus. When an encounter between a doctor and a rep goes well, it is a delicate ritual of pretense and self-deception. <laughs> Drug reps pretend that they are giving doctors impartial information. Doctors pretend that they take it seriously. Drug <laughs> reps must try their best to influence doctors, while doctors must tell themselves that they are not being influenced. <laughs> Drug reps must act as if they are not salespeople, while doctors must act as if they are not consumers. And if, by accident, the real purpose of the exchange is revealed, the result is like an elaborate theatrical dance in which the masks and costumes suddenly drop off and the actors come face to face with one another as they really are. Nobody wants to see that happen. Now, one of the drugs that sold very well in the 1950s was chloramphenicol. Um, has anyone ever prescribed chloramphenicol? Yeah? Yeah? Right. Has anyone ever prescribed oral chloramphenicol? Oh, a few. Yeah, okay. Now, there's a good reason for that, right? Um, it causes aplastic anemia in every 8th to 20,000th patient. Um, and this was being reported as early as 1952. But the company, Park Davis, continued to vigorously market it as a safe antibiotic. And doctors believed the reps with whom they had a good rapport rather than warnings from external bodies like the FDA. And it sold well, millions of prescriptions, right on until 1966, when sales plummeted. And what happened in 1966? It came off patent. So there was no push from the uh, reps to try and get it um, prescribed. And so it stopped being prescribed in favor of other safer drugs. So I'd like you to think again about John Bodkin Adams and Ernest Dichter. On the one, you've got this innocent until proven guilty, alleged bumper off of little old ladies. And on the other hand, you've got this fascinating, hardworking, deep thinker who believed in consumerism as the best protection the world had against the return of the fascism for which he'd been forced to flee. Now, I'm not saying right, that Dr. Adams did it. He definitely did it, right? <laughs> but if he did it, he so did it, right? If he did it, he's responsible for the deaths of at most 160 people. But the application of Dichter's techniques to the hard selling of dangerous medications across the world could have caused many times more people to die from bone marrow failure. Good people acting with good intentions can cause inadvertent harm. And this makes the point about conflicts of interest, right? Having a conflict of interest it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't mean you're immoral. The definition of having a conflict of interest is being in a situation 
where any normal moral person would feel temptation to act against their professional duties. But we as doctors, we've until very recently assumed somewhat naively that we're above such temptations. I want you to think about other professions for a minute, like not noble ones like ours. Let's think about ones we more readily associate with venality and corruption, okay? This is the most trusted professions according to Maury, right? Uh, we're no longer at the top, actually, after the junior doctor strike. You know, we said we were going to strike properly. We didn't. No one trusts us anymore. Yada, 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 <laughs> right? But about halfway down here, look, 50, 54% you'll find lawyers. Ew, lawyers, right? Now, lawyers have long understood about conflicts of interest. They've got rules about it. You know, you want to get divorced? Can I, can, will you be my lawyer? No, I'm already representing your wife. I have a conflict of interest. I can't do it. They've, they've got rules about it. And if we plunge further down here, like down into the gutter, what have we got here? 27, we've got journalists. And journalists have rules about conflicts of interest, which at least the honorable ones will respect. And then right at the bottom here, yeah, down at the bottom, via video link, right, we've got <laughs> politicians, okay. Um, now, they have a register of members' interests. So your MP is allowed to take payment from a company who wants to frack in your back garden, but they have to declare it on the register of members' interests for all to see. So these professions have recognized that conflicts of interest arise, and so they've hardwired systems in place to contain them. But we, as medics, we think we get a free pass because we take the Hippocratic Oath and we're honest and trustworthy people, and being good is just imbued in our culture. But this complicit, symbiotic entanglement with the pharmaceutical industry and their interests is also imbued within our culture. I'm thinking back to my first encounter with it back in the 90s. Right, I'm a clinical medical student. I'm shadowing the house off of this. Sadly, it was not my team, okay? But I do think I had that exact same tie, right? Now... <laughs> I'm going to the canteen for lunch, and then the, the house officer says, uh, no, come to the Grand Round and get free food off the drug rep. And I'm like, what, for free? And I've got a free sandwich, and a free pen torch, and a free the ECG made easy. And I'm not going to lie, I was like, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> free stuff, you know. And then when I was the house officer, and my boss said, uh, we're going for a, a firm meal. I was like, well, like for a curry or something. I said, Don't be silly. We're not going for a curry. We're going to a poshest restaurant in town, and you can have whatever you like, and it's all getting paid for by the drug rep. So I'm like, yeah, encore du vin, s'il vous plaît. We, you know. um, but I, I'm also thinking, you know, I've just worked a 100 hour week, right? Don't we deserve this? Don't we deserve someone to be nice to us and look after us? Isn't this? And, and my mentors, you know, the people I'm aspiring to be like, they're saying, yeah, don't worry, come down, get the food. It doesn't mean anything. You can talk to the rep if you like, whatever, right? So my next question, I don't know if you can put the next question up. Uh, why do reps give free gifts to doctors? Is it A, because it makes the doctors prescribe more of their drugs, or is it B, because the reps are idiots, okay? <laughs> Yeah. And of course, the answer is A, right? Um, because it makes us prescribe more drugs. But when I asked you lot if you personally <laughs> prescribed more drugs because of free gifts, you all said, well, 25% of you admitted you did. So it was like, no, we don't do that. And of course, this is a self-selecting audience, right? You've all academically-minded GPs. You've come to RCGP conference. And within that, you've sub-chosen to see the great Margaret McCartney and her bizarre warm-up man. And, like, <laughs> maybe you as a group are less susceptible. But these results have been replicated in study after study, right? Everyone agrees that doctors are influenced. We just won't admit it's us. Yeah, okay, can I have my next slide? So... Now I'm a bit woke, uh, so I don't see reps at work, um, but I was making some notes for this talk, and I was like, oh, this is a nice pen, and it says serotide on it. Now, I don't know how I got it. It's, it's almost like this sentient farmer gift has worked its way into, into my hand of its own accord, like it's a cursed monkey's paw or something. But I wonder, how many of you have got a branded pen on your possession right now? Yeah, colleagues, we are entangled, okay? So... Uh, this is uh, Harold Bornstein, who wrote a medical report for the then presidential candidate, Donald J. Trump, which included the line, his blood pressure and laboratory results were astonishingly excellent. Now, <laughs> now he, admitted, he admitted this year that Trump had dictated the letter, and he had merely signed it. So here we are, right? we're in the age of Trump, the age of fake news. 
So how do we know who to trust? Of course, there have been changes since the 1950s. We've got the GMC duties of a doctor has some guidance on conflicts of interest. And nowadays, you won't get a free restaurant meal out of a drug rep unless there's a doctor there at the meal giving an educational talk on behalf of the company. Now, while researching this talk, I found two separate sources that said that reps privately refer to these presenting doctors as drug whores. And you'll also find drug whores, their words, not mine, right? speaking to audience in meetings and conferences just like this one. Now, of course, we expect the presenter to declare their conflict of interest at the beginning of the presentation, but this doesn't really work, right? So this is the slide I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. I said I've worked for medical organizations and various biotech companies, and I showed these official-looking logos. And this is a trick I've seen pulled a few times by drug whores uh, at conferences. And because we're all polite and British, no one actually stops to say, well, hang on a minute, who's, who's that company? And what drugs do they make? And how much exactly were you paid and what proportion of your income does that represent? Which are all important questions that need answering if you are to get a proper understanding of how significant my conflict of interest is. Now just imagine if you could sit there as I talk and log on to the GMC website and easily access that information online. Now wouldn't that be a more transparent way of doing things? And as it happens, I haven't really worked for Devlin McGregor Pharmaceuticals. Does anyone know what drug Devlin McGregor make? They only make one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's right. They make Provasic, which is the, uh, the drug Richard Kimball found out causes liver damage, so they had to send that one-armed man to kill his wife. Okay. Now, similarly, I haven't really worked for OCP, who are, of course, the makers of Robocop, or uh, Wayland Yutani, <laughs> the terraforming company in the Alien franchise. My actual conflict of interest is more mundane. I've been paid to be here in that I would have come anyway, but when you speak at this uh, RCGP conference, uh, as a presenter, my flights and hotel get reimbursed by the conference organizers. So the bed I'm going to sleep in tonight was paid for by the conference sponsors. And who, you may ask, are the conference sponsors? So let's look on the RCGP website. Nova Nordisk, Edwards, MSD, L'Oreal, and Chiesi. This is who's putting me up tonight. Now, I can't think of a greater demonstration of the need to detangle ourselves from the influence of pharma reps than the fact that in my attempts to inform you about it, I've unwittingly myself become a big pharma stooge. Okay. <laughs> so there is a lot more to conflict of interest than just interactions between individual doctors and drug reps. And here to talk about it in more detail is one of my personal medical heroes, not a term I use lightly, the great Dr. Margaret McCartney. Thank you.